Our reading today is from Exodus 20. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other God before me. Amen. Hey, everyone. We're going to start a new series today called Freedom. And it's actually a study of the Ten Commandments. And it's called Freedom because from the biblical perspective, there is no more free way to live your life, no more liberating way to experience life than through the Ten Commandments. Uh, and you'll, you'll see what I mean by that in a second. But freedom is a very popular idea. Um, obviously, now in the news, <laughs> we're seeing a lot of uh, contention and um, maybe conflict behind different and various definitions of freedom and, and uses of freedom. But uh, honestly, that's always been the case. Uh, freedom is one of those things that's highly mythologized and misunderstood. So if we went backward in time. Let's take a look at Sophocles, who his perspective of freedom encapsulated in this short little phrase is essentially an escape. He says, if my body is enslaved, still my mind can be free. It, this is the beginning of the whole mind over matter kind of philosophy. And, and his perspective of freedom is uh, escape from limitation, escape from confinement, escape from circumstance. And, and you could even see how, though Sophocles wrote this thousands of years ago, many Americans today, many people in the West today, in fact, many people in the world today hold a very similar kind of definition of freedom, an escape from all limitation. Some years later in Rome, Marcus Cicero would develop this idea that Sophocles presented to the world by saying, what then is freedom? The power to live as one wishes. And so for Cicero, he would say, it's not just, not only is freedom an escape from limitation, but in doing so, after you're freed from limitation, you now have the power to live however you want. And so it's twofold, right? Two sides of one coin. Not only the absence of limitation, but the presence of power to do whatever you want. If that doesn't sound American, uh, then I don't know. I really don't know more of a westernized American definition of freedom than really that. But too deep in the point. Um, a few years later, another famous philosopher by the name of Nietzsche would come on the scene and he would take the writings of Sophocles and other Greek philosophers, the writings of Cicero and other Roman philosophers, and he would define freedom as such. He said, freedom is the will to be responsible for ourselves. It is to preserve the distance which separates us from other men to grow more indifferent to hardship, to severity, to privation, and even to life itself. It's, it's almost, in many ways, it's almost a, um, a destination that we're all meant to live. For Nietzsche, freedom isn't just a, a thing that he thought about and wrote about, like Sophocles or like Cicero, but it was something that he argued was um, the, the way that we all should actually live. Um, it, it, it is not with coincidence, therefore, that in the founding of the United States and uh, the Western world, freedom became a sort of an intrinsic value uh, nationally and legislatively, right? And, and then some years after Nietzsche, one of my favorite writers, Oscar Wilde, who's not a Christian, arguably a, a spiritual in, and, um, in many ways, but Oscar Wilde said this, freedom, individualism, and being yourself so long as you don't hurt another's physical person or property. The true artist is a man who believes absolutely in himself because he is absolutely himself. So what he's saying is, and this, in my opinion, summarizes and captures all the previous definitions of freedom and uh, also captures absolutely our, our cultural moments of view of freedom, and that's that freedom is not just absence of limitation and the power to do what you want. It's not just something that you're meant to experience, but experiencing freedom, says, says Oscar Wilde, that's the truest version of who you are. 
And so if you look at, at t if you watch television and um, read certain modern books within the last, I'd say, 40 years in the West, there's a lot of messaging around this very definition and this very perspective of freedom that if you want to be tr if you want to be authentic, you have to be true to yourself, which is in an, it's an idea that is an ex it's a, a freedom idea. It's an extension of one's perspective of freedom. If you watch Disney Channel, someone's in a predicament, you know, uh, they lied uh, to their friend when they shouldn't have, or they're in a situation where they're pressured to do something they're not sure whether they should do. The advice that is constantly given is be true to yourself. And, and that is the culmination of the West's development of, of its understanding of freedom. And so in essence, we can define freedom from our cultural perspective, as I can do whatever I want, whenever I want, without repercussion. Whatever I want, whenever I want, without repercussion. And so if you're, you know, you too, I mean, think about it. If you're in high school, you're, you're younger, there are times when you have thought, I wish my parents would give me more freedom. Uh, there are times when, when you have felt, I wish I had more freedom. And in, in doing so, sure, we might, some of us, we might not, uh, we might justify that phrase by saying, you know, I'm not asking for much, but the logic of the word freedom you're using and implementing when you think that and feel that, it's a very American Western 20, 21st century variant of freedom. And in fact, I think that the, the reason why people have such a hard time with Christianity and with God is because people, particularly in the West, grow up with this kind of definition of freedom. And that definition of freedom is really what made America possible. It's what really made the West possible. It's this kind of freedom that soldiers have died for. And so when you have something like a God who has some contingencies on freedom or, or limits your freedom. A lot of people resist that and they hesitate to believe in a God like that. And so our culture today, as it per pertains to God, either is he's denied because he's critical of freedom or he's sort of uh, twisted and manipulated to be complicit to their version of freedom, right? You, you watch the news, you see these uh, <laughs> these pastors who are, it, you know, granted there are a lot of them in the South, they're talking about American freedom of worship. And then they're bringing, you know, they're opening their doors. They're even, you know, there's a couple of pastors, I think who got arrested during COVID, uh, during quarantine, because they refused to, to stop assembling, right? And so that is the perfect example of, of exactly this idea of freedom. It's whatever I want, however I want. And as it pertains to God, if God doesn't agree with me, he's out of the picture. Uh, or God, I'm, go I'm going to make God <laughs> agree with me. And in fact, I'm going to use God to prove that this is in fact the definition of freedom. But my friends, there is a big, big problem with this view of freedom. Um, it is actually impossible to experience. It is so contradictive that it is an impossibility. Here's what I mean. There are some freedoms that I want to experience in my life. When there was a season in my life where I was gung-ho. I was crazy about rock climbing. Uh, you, you look at my YouTube feed, that's all the videos I was watching, different climbing techniques, and that's all I did virtually every single day. Every morning I go to the climbing gym. It's either work out and, prepare, you know, and train yourself for climbing, and then in the evening go and boulder and climb, uh, or it's just climbing throughout the day. Uh, but every week, I would probably go climbing uh, either once a day or multiple times a day. And in order to, to have the freedom, to experience the freedom of rock climbing, what I would do is I would sacrifice and I would limit myself from other freedoms. So, you know, as, as much as I love climbing, I also loved really good food. But a lot of good food is, is not good for you in certain quantities. And so I, I gave up my freedom to eat whatever I wanted, whenever I wanted, 
so that I can experience uh, what I thought was a better freedom, the freedom to, to rock climb. Uh, people who run marathons, people who want to experience the freedom of running a marathon, they have to limit out of their lives and confine themselves uh, within what they think are better freedoms. You want to win a marathon or run a marathon? Well, you cannot experience the freedom to eat whatever you want, to not work out, to only go to the gym a certain amount of times uh, per week. You have to limit those freedoms, get rid of those freedoms so that you can experience what you would, you would perceive as higher and better freedoms. And so you can't do both. You can't both, you can't both experience the freedom to eat, uh, a, a, to live on a diet of purely just ice cream and, and chicken nuggets and also expect to win a marathon. Those two freedoms cannot be experienced at the same time. So freedom cannot be doing whatever I want, whenever I want, however I want. Because even God himself doesn't abide by that definition of freedom. There are things, there are quote unquote freedoms that God himself does not experience and cannot experience. God himself cannot experience the freedom to lie. God himself cannot experience the freedom to contradict himself, to not exist. You see, so this idea, this Western fantasized mythological idea of freedom being the ability to do whatever you want, whenever you want, however you want, without repercussion. And that sense of freedom being who you truly are and what you were meant for is a fantasy. It's a logical contradiction and fallacy, first of all but experientially, it's a complete fantasy. Instead, true freedom, much like the whole il the illustration with the marathon runner or being an athlete, true freedom is when you experience freedom within the confines of your design. And, and this is where the Bible comes in, and, and as we'll see in a second. I want you to think about a fish. If, if I got a fish, and I threw it up in the air, or I dropped it from an airplane, expecting it to experience freedom, it wouldn't. It would immediately die because a fish is not meant to experience freedom. A fish's freedom is not experienced in the air. If I took a fish and drove to Nevada and let it out in the desert, it would immediately die. It would suffer and then die because a fish does not experience true freedom on land. Where does a fish experience ultimate freedom? It's when it's confined. It's when it's limited to water. And in fact, if you ask a fish, how do you like living in the water? A fish would tell you, I, I would not like to live anywhere else. Please and thank you. Freedom is not the ability to do whatever, however, right, as much as we want without repercussion or accountability, but freedom, freedom, both logically, as we'll see biblically is experienced when we limit ourselves to our design. An ice skater, a, a figure skater skates beautifully uh, and, and almost majestically when you limit her or him to the ice rink. And so it is with you. And so it is with me. That's, that's the true meaning of freedom. That's the true logic of freedom. And in fact, I, if, if we were to believe in Oscar Wilde and say freedom is, is really, and, and Nietzsche and say freedom is what you, you were meant for, then this is the kind of freedom you were meant for. This is the definition of freedom. This notion of freedom is really what contextualizes our passage and the, and the passages that will come in the next 10 weeks. The, the 10 commandments and God's giving of that is contextualized by this understanding of freedom. So you have the Israelites in Exodus who have been enslaved by the Egyptians for hundreds and hundreds of years until God raises up a, a leader or a savior of sorts um, named Moses. And Moses pleads with Pharaoh and in a very powerful 
uh, visually powerful, cosmically powerful way through the 10 plagues, God um, leads Pharaoh to let his people go. And so Moses then takes the Israelites out of slavery from Egypt and he leads them into the wilderness through the crossing of the Red Sea. And as they're uh, walking uh, through the Red Sea and past the Red Sea, there's a pillar of fire and a pillar of smoke that leads them. And they are now being led to what God called the promised land. They're, they're being led to the land of freedom, away from Egypt, away from bondage, away from slavery. And so one would think that the story after the Red Sea story, the crossing of the Red Sea, when they make it to the other side, when their pursuers, the Egyptians, are then swallowed by the, the closing of the sea, you would think that the story to follow is, and then Israel lived happily ever after. They did whatever they wanted. They went wherever they wanted. That, because that would be, that, that would be our, <clears throat> that would be a version of this story that fits our Western American definition of freedom. But that's not what happens, right? <clears throat> as soon as Israel crosses and gets to the other side, <clears throat> Moses leads them to Mount Sinai. <clears throat> Excuse me. And it's at Mount Sinai where one very <clears throat> important thing happens. In fact, you could say the reason Moses leads Israel to Mount Sinai is for this one important thing, and that is God giving the Israelites the Ten Commandments. So, you could summarize the story of Israel in, in the book of Exodus like this. God frees his people from Egypt so that they can live life under the Ten Commandments. He frees them from Egypt to Sinai for the purpose of finally truly liberating them, giving them ultimate, true, genuine freedom within the Ten Commandments. And so the Ten Commandments, despite what we might think culturally about it, are not barriers to freedom. They are the bridge to freedom. And the Ten Commandments are not meant to stifle your life, but to flourish your life. And the first of which is this commandment right here. Exodus 20, in uh, the chapter the entire chapter of Exodus 20 really is about the Ten Commandments. And we find the Ten Commandments in other places in the Bible as well. But we're going we're gonna to use Exodus 20's account of the Ten Commandments for the next 10 weeks and, and study the Ten Commandments in Exodus 20. And in doing so, uh, actually, each Sunday, we're going to uh, send down some discussion questions and review questions for you to think about throughout the week with your family, if, if you're comfortable with that. But my invitation to you, my challenge to you is also to memorize the Ten Commandments, uh, at least, if not by name and verse like here, at least know what the Ten Commandments are in order. And the order is significant, as we'll see in a moment, okay? So here's the first commandment. Exodus 20, verse 1 to 3, again, God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. So what is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. So a couple times, okay? So we can memorize. The first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Again, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. Okay? Let's get it, get it, get it deep. <laughs> make, make sure it sticks. What is the first commandment? You shall have no other gods before me. Now, Right off the bat, this is the first commandment, and there's something very curious about it, right? Because God, capital G God, says, you shall have no other gods, lowercase g, before me. Now, of course, as, as Christians and according to the Bible, there are no other gods. There's only one God. In fact, there were, if there were other gods, you could argue that God himself of the Bible would not be God. So there are no other gods. So why does... God, the only true God, in the very first commandment, suggests maybe that there, that there are, 
Why does he say, you shall have no other gods before me? As if there were other gods. Well, here's why. <clears throat> I think Tim Keller is one of my, you know, is a mentor of mine in, a, in, in many ways, whose influence really saved me as a Christian. He summarizes this idea best. The reason why God's first commandment says, you shall have no other gods before me is because God knows that everyone has a tendency to worship. And most often, falsely so. So here's what Keller says. Every person, religious or not, let me, let me say that again. Every person, religious or not, okay? Religious or not religious is worshiping something. Idols, pseudo-saviors, to get their worth. But these things enslave us with guilt if we fail to attain them, or anger if someone blocks them from us, or fear if they are threatened, or drivenness since we, have, since we must have them. Guilt, anger, fear, and drivenness are like fire that destroys us. Sin is worshiping anything but Jesus and the wages of sin is slavery. Keller is essentially saying what we've been talking about for the last several weeks. He's saying, when you look at what you do, what you do, your actions come from your values. Your values, they pertain to your identity. Your identity comes from what you believe to be true. But ultimately, the core, the core thing that motivates all your behavior and what you do and how you live your life is what you worship. When you think about what did Eve do? in the garden. Why did she eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, even though God told her not to do that? Because she worshiped something. She worshiped either this idea of being free from God's limited obedience, or, or she, she thought she worshiped this idea of possessing knowledge beyond her, 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 her nature and her circumstance. There was worship happening in her heart that drove her to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There was worship in Adam's heart to make him complicit in eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Why, when Moses brings the Ten Commandments down from Mount Sinai to present to Israel, why does he find Israel worshiping not a baby cow, not a cow, but a baby cow, a calf, a golden calf? Because Israel, they, they had other worship happening in their heart. They saw this majestic, magnificent God who deserved reverence and fear and respect. They didn't like that. What they wanted was a tiny, golden, baby calf of a God that they could control, that, that made sense to them, that they could manipulate and use for their own good, that, that would justify them. Uh, justify their sinful behavior. They wanted uh, freedom from reverence and obedience. They worshipped, in other words, maybe their self-control. And so if the, these two examples seem a little like esoteric for you, you're not sure where, where that's, how that's connecting with your life, well, let me just ask you a couple of questions. What devastates you? Because that is the thing that you worship. Uh, I use this example many, many times, but uh, there are two people who really are committed to going to the same school. They're both wanting to get into Harvard, uh, and they are incredibly committed and devoted to studying and to getting, uh, they're pursuing the highest level of excellence uh, academically. And one of, and, and they both take, they're part of the same class, and they both take a, a final that was necessary to get into, let's say, uh, let's say the SATs, for instance, they, that's, that's the one exam that, that is to permit them entry into Harvard. One of them, uh, or, or let's say they both don't get in. One person is very discouraged, but he or she decides, you know what, um, it's not the end of the world. I, I'm going to try harder on something else. I'm going to either try again or uh, I'm going to you know, maybe go to my secondary school and transfer later or something like that. The other person, when that person fails, not only is uh, discouraged, but they are utterly devastated. They want to kill themselves. They feel like they're worthless. They feel like they're stupid. They, they hate themselves. 
They regret ever existing. That second person, while the first person, uh, you, you could say it has goals or has a vision to get to Harvard, the second person worships Harvard. So, so what devastates you? If you're dating someone and you break up and you're, you just, your life falls apart and you want to just die, it sounds like you worshipped that relationship. Or how about what infuriates you? Uh, if you're running late and, and there's other stuff, either traffic lights or other people that you're waiting on making you more late and you get furious, you get livid, sounds like you worship not just being on time, but looking, looking impressive, maybe. Looking like somebody who has their life in control, who doesn't show up late. What infuriates you? And it could be a good thing, too. It, if, if, if racial issues infuriate you, it sounds like you worship race issues. Or how about this? What captivates you? One of the things Keller talks about when, it, when he's uh, teaching his congregation to think about what they worship, knowing that all people worship something. One of the things he, one of the questions he asks is, what do you daydream about? When you're sitting there and, and you're kind of, you know, nothing, you're at a bus, I don't know how many of you <laughs> take the bus, but let's say you're at a bus stop. You're just hanging out. You're not looking at your phone. You're just daydreaming. You're letting your mind wander. What, what, do, you, what do you wonder about? Um, when you're at, going to bed at night and you start dreaming about stuff, what captivates you? Is it a, a great career? Man, you start dreaming about, man, I really wish I had this car. Or I really, man, I, I dream of the day where I get a boyfriend or girlfriend that looks like this. Is that what captivates you? Because then that's, that's probably what you worship. See, everyone worships. And at the root of all that we do, says the Bible, is actually worship. And that's why God, in the very first commandment, right off the bat, says the most, in fact, in many ways, the most important thing that you need to know as people to experience freedom is you need to not only know that everybody worships something, but you need to know what it is that you worship. And everything else that you worship outside of Jesus is going to enslave and destroy you. As a parenthetical point, let me also say this. Um, for this reason, Different scholars like Martin Luther, who we studied in uh, life groups, who is one of the first reformers, he said something very interesting. He said, all other commandments, to summarize this quote here, all the no other nine commandments of the Ten Commandments, they hinge, they, they, are, they build a top of the first commandment. So it's not so much that the Ten Commandments are just 10 separate rules to live your life by if you're a good boy or girl. But the Ten Commandments, in many ways, it's a, it's a way to experience freedom starting with the First Commandment. And the First Commandment informs and navigates and helps you understand all the other commandments. Because, again, everything we do is not just contingent, but it's an extension of what we worship. And so the First Command, again, it's... You shall have no other gods before me, meaning you were meant for worship. God created you to worship something. That's why you all worship something. We all worship little g gods all the time, whether it's career or school. But our worship is meant only for God. And at any moment when we worship someone or something other than God, our life doesn't become more free. It becomes less free. It becomes enslaved. So let me just, right? That's it. There's another way to illustrate, illustrate the, this idea of worship. Worship produces everything. All right, so let me just give you three examples of, of how worshiping other gods, little g gods, destroys your life. And let's just talk about the three most important, quote unquote, gods that people tend to struggle with and people tend to worship. Number one, Money. If you worship money, and, and this, is, this is what I have seen 
as a very contemporary example of someone who worships money, uh, ultimately your, your perspective of human dignity is destroyed. So I have some friends who worship money and money never, ever, ever, ever lets you know that you have enough money. But money always tells you that you don't have enough of it. Even if you make millions of it, you, you are, it's, it's the way that money works. It only reveals how much more money you need. Never does it say money, a million dollars in your bank account doesn't tell you, hey, that's enough now. No, but a million dollars in your bank account tells you, here are things that you can purchase with a million dollars. But here are things you can you can purchase with a hundred million dollars. And so, you know, again, again, this is, this is not, this is not every, everybody, it's just, just a conventional stereotype, but a conventional example. Um, how many parents, because of their worship of money, were not there to raise their kids? How many people, because they worship money, have lost friendships? I've seen families, siblings, uh, hate one another, not even uh, talk to one another because of money. How many people uh, suddenly feel uh, like like they are have the right to say or do something audacious simply because they have money? Just look at the news, right? Money does not, uh, the worship of money doesn't liberate you. It actually enslaves you. It enslaves you to, to getting more of it, to protecting it, to hoarding it. Or talk about sex. For those who worship sex, inevitably, again, this is not everybody, but a conventional example of this is uh, people who, are, who worship sex are constantly obsessed with how they look, with their body, with dressing in a very specific way, looking, uh, being under this body weight or having this much BMI or working out this many times. If your worship is sex, you're gonna constantly be, you're gonna destroy yourself for the sake of looking more and more attractive to the other sex. Or if you worship power, and, and a lot of people, when they think of power, they think of like the, you know, I don't know, they think of like uh, the Avengers or something like that. Um, no, that's not, that's not power. In, in a more sociological sense, power, you could even say is like influence, it's capital, it's leverage. And people who worship power are obsessed with how they look in front of other people. They're obsessed with their influence on others. And so one of the, one of the primary ways people try to attain power in, in society is, is number one, particularly in Asian American communities, is you go to a better school than so-and-so. And that's power. Or you drive a better car than so-and-so. Or your house is bigger than so-and-so's. And so that's power right there. It's also money, certainly. But it's power. And the more that you worship power and influence and leverage, you're going to destroy yourself. You're going to destroy your family. You're going to destroy your friends and your friendships and your relationships to get more power, to get more influence, to get a bigger house, to get a wealthier car, uh, to, to work for a bigger company, to get to a better college, to have more clubs on your resume than so-and-so. Everybody worships something. And therefore, the first commandment that God is telling us is you shall have no other gods. You shall not worship anyone or anything other than me because when you do you don't become more liberated you become less liberated you don't become more free you become less free because no one is worthy of worship other than god and no one is worthy of worship other than god because god unlike all those other things money sex and power though he deserves it right on his own because he, he pursued you while you were worshiping other things other than him. He, right here in verse 2, he says, I am the Lord your God who brought you. I freed you out of slavery. 
I freed you from slavery, and, and therefore now will you worship me. Or another way to put it is, money, sex, and power, and all the variations of each, they will demand, they will demand that you go to a cross for their sake. Getting into the best schools, that is a cross to bear. It is difficult. It is self-sacrificing to look really, really good in front of other people, to be the skinniest or to be the muscular, most muscular, whatever, or, or the cleverest. That's hard work. You have to sacrifice yourself to do that. Money, sex, and power, and the variations of all of each within themselves demand you go to a cross for their sake, but only Jesus. Only Jesus has gone to a cross for your sake. And so who else? Who else is worthy of worship but him? Christianity, it doesn't begin with good works. Christianity begins with godly worship. That you would worship he who, though you were worshiping other things and other people, sought you, purchased you, died for you on the cross so that your worship, so that the attention and focus of your worship may change unto him so that as you worship him, you may experience true freedom, a kind of freedom that can never, ever come from worshiping anything and anyone else. Freedom that you were meant for, freedom that you were designed for. Again, freedom that only comes from having no other gods but God alone. And as a more practical application point here, how do you know? How do you know that you're worshiping Jesus above all else? Well, I'll let Pastor John Piper speak into this. This is his perhaps most famous quote of all time. He says, God is most glorified in me when I am most satisfied in him. How do you know that, that Jesus is your ultimate uh, ultimate source of worship, not source, but ultimate ends of worship. How is it that you know that more than school and friends and body image and whatever influence, more than money, sex, and power, you worship Jesus? How do you know? You know because you are most satisfied in him. Because nothing captivates you more than he does. Because nothing enamors you more than his beauty. Sure, we're imperfect. We'll slip up throughout the week. But at the end of each day, nothing satiates you like Jesus. That's how you know. That's how you know that you're worshiping Jesus. And it's, and it's that worship that sets us free. Let me pray for us. Father, I thank you so much for your mercy and grace your love that has sought us while, while we were worshiping falsely. Lord, you came to this earth and died on a cross and took all that falsity away from us. You took all that false worship upon yourself so that we may experience freedom, freedom as we were meant to, as part of our design, through worshiping you and you alone. Help us, Jesus. Holy Spirit, will you purge false worship from our hearts? Purge, purge false worship in our, in our midst, in our families. Protect us from false worship. Instead, lead us, Lord. Lead us by this command. You shall have no other gods before me. Help us to worship you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen.